Hello, I am Jake Collins, and this is my commentary for the seventh episode of The Mummy, Secrets of the Magi, The Cold. Unsurprisingly, this little excursion in the Caribbean Sea is a quest to find a MacGuffin artifact, in this case the Chalice of Augustus, as directed by Fenwick, the museum curator. We shouldn't be surprised to see that by now. Although you could be forgiven for thinking, looking at this scene, that it's Rick and Alex entering the international buffest father and son deep sea diving competition. And if that were the case, I'm sure they would win in all categories, and I'm sure Alex would be awarded best in show. However, that's not actually what's going on, even though it's what it looks like. It's a opening standalone MacGuffin, the Chalice of Augustus, and they're about to go off after another one, again, under the direction of the curator. It's a new status quo, as I say, that makes no sense. But I thought I'd take this opportunity to make a general point about Alex in this series, or build on a couple of things I've been saying about Alex in this series couple of specific things that I haven't yet found an opportunity to slip into any of the stuff I've been saying. I was quite surprised to find that Alex had grown up in season two of the show, or what turned out to be season two of the show, when I saw it on CBBC, because that doesn't normally happen to kids in cartoons. As everybody knows, they generally are an age, and they'll stay that age for five years or ten years or whatever, as the cartoon is being made. But with Alex, obviously, that didn't happen. Time has moved on for the second season, and that's why I thought when I saw him in the Aglophones episode, The Enemy of My Enemy, that they'd had the balls to grow him up. They'd actually bothered to make a believable cartoon world with moving time, time moving forward. And the only other one I could think of that I'd ever seen that had done that, the only other cartoon, was Digimon. And like Digimon, I thought, well, when they do age these kid characters, they do it by about five years at a time. Because that's what had happened in Digimon 2. The characters that had aged in season 2, I thought, were a heck of a lot older all of a sudden. And the same is true of Alex, but I think in both cases, it's only supposed to be a couple of years at most. But you can certainly see and hear the difference on screen. I was also talking about Alex's height in this series being rather inconsistent, which is true. And in the previous episode, when I noted that he was the same height as Evie, pretty much, during their star fight sequence on the boat, in which Alex tips Evie overboard, I think that's about the right height for Alex to be. And in the shot I'm looking at at the moment, he's not quite as tall as Evie. But they shouldn't be afraid to have Alex as tall as Evie, or slightly taller than Evie, even. As a lot of boys become taller than their mothers at the age of about 12 or 13. So that would certainly be a suitable thing for Alex to be at this point. About the same height as his mum. So in my head canon, that's what is the case. I'm about to read my review for the episode, but I'm going to have to say first, now that it's on the screen, I think Imhotep may have used his, I call upon the beast within power, to enslave these polar bears, who look pretty demonic in that shot where they appear pulling the sled. So I said I'd look out for other occasions in this series where Imhotep had called upon the beast within, apart from the rhinos that we're going to see in a couple of episodes' time. And there we go. I think he's done it with those polar bears. A poorly realised episode that misses a great chance for redemption. 5 out of 10. I find this episode rather poor. It's entirely fuelled by MacGuffins, which is only to be expected by this point, but in my opinion the potentially interesting locations and guest creatures don't come across nearly so well as they should. The change in dynamic between Imhotep and Weasler, and its possible ongoing consequences, offers a heck of a lot, but delivers very little. 
However, I could have forgiven all this and decided to fairly like the episode overall if it wasn't for the criminally wasted opportunity to have Alex come through as a true and pure-hearted hero by releasing the ice trolls from their servitude at the end. He managed to get his hands on the locket, so why didn't he do it? Simply because some writers can't recognise a golden opportunity to flesh out and develop a great hero when they see one. Yes, indeed. It's a 5 out of 10 episode. It could easily, as I said on the last commentary, have gone up to a 7 or maybe an 8. If certain things about it were developed more, I don't think it would ever have been a 9 for me, but it should be a 7 or an 8, and yet it's stuck down on 5, for the reasons I mentioned there. We've seen in that bit on the sled with Imhotep and Weasler, the two of them having a bit of better back-and-forth conversation interplay than they usually have, and Imhotep using Colin as a break in order to slow the sled down. So, when Colin turns against Imhotep later in the episode, we can definitely see why that happened, even if we don't remember all the stuff that's happened between them already, and that Colin is very much treated as a slave. And here we go again, he's saying he wants a reward once they take over the world, New Zealand perhaps, or Borneo, and Imhotep says, your reward is just to be alive. It's better interplay between them than usual, and it kind of leads on nicely to Colin turning against Imhotep. But, as I say, it's not all it could be. But what's particularly disappointing about the interplay between those two in this episode is what happens at the end, or what is said at the end of the episode, and is never at all elaborated upon in the series, and it sounds like a very interesting thing that should be developed in some way. As I say in the review there, it promises much and delivers, well, nothing in the end. Which is a bit of a shame. The ice trolls in this episode, the Fodden, they are potentially interesting. But again, as I say in the review, they're not coming across nearly so well, so interesting as they should. They have some nice links to Norse mythology, trolls and that sort of thing, with ice powers. That very much fits in with where we are in the world. We're in Greenland again, of course. We were there in season one at one point, just at the beginning of an episode, to check in with Alex's progress, with how he was getting along with the manacle. And speaking of the manacle, he doesn't do anything with it in this one. I was very disappointed to realise just now Alex doesn't actually use it at all in this episode. Very unusual. He does use some of his Magi fighting skills, although not as many as I would have liked, but no manacle. As I've said before, there really are only a couple of episodes where you can see those manacle and Magi skills in conjunction, and that's what we should be seeing all the time. This is a bit of a random power for Imhotep, I suppose, from the depths of ice, awake to serve a new master. He just kind of needs to be able to awaken the fodden king like that for the episode to take place. And there, of course, is another MacGuffin, the Amulet Locket of Control for the fodden. I was wondering, does this episode actually break the record for number of MacGuffins seen on screen? Well, we've got the trident of Voth at the end, and that locket of control for the Fodden, and the chalice of Augustus at the beginning. So that's three definite on-screen MacGuffins. Might be something of a record. It's certainly much more than we should ever be seeing in one episode. But I do find the Fodden, as I say, potentially interesting, even though they don't do anything very interesting in the episode. Even when they put Imhotep on ice for a while, I don't find it that interesting. But what is interesting about the Fodden is they're not inherently evil or anything like that. They just do the bidding of whoever has this locket, which is, of course, Corlin at the moment, which allows him to turn against Imhotep for a while. Which, again, isn't as interesting on screen as it perhaps could be.
So what do you do if you're the true hero of a piece like this and you manage to get hold of the amulet of control for supernatural creatures that can and frequently are used in evil ways to do evil but aren't inherently evil themselves? What do you do to keep them out of harm's way? To keep their control MacGuffin out of harm's way so nobody back can use it? You give it to the chief whatever in this case, the Chief Fodden, so that they can be their own masters, or at least their Chief can be the master of all of them, and they won't have to do evil anymore, they won't have to do anyone's bidding, and you come through as a true and pure-hearted hero in that way. We've seen this in some versions of The Wizard of Oz, with the flying monkeys and the hat that controls them. It even reminded me, once again, of Aladdin, where the genie is very much a source of power that can be used for evil, and at times is, and freeing the genie at the end is very much the same sort of thing as giving him back the power, that has the same effect of giving back the MacGuffin, that controls the group of creatures, whatever it is. And who, in these cases, is the pure-hearted hero who frees the supernatural creatures from servitude in this way? Well, obviously, it's our main protagonist hero who we're getting behind and we really enjoy seeing, watching, reading about, whatever. Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, Aladdin in Aladdin, Alex O'Connell in The Mummy. So you would think if ever Alex got hold of that locket of control, he would make it a priority to hand it over to the leader of the Fodden and say, you're free. And we would think, wow, what a great hero Alex is. Not for the first time would we think that, but we should be given the chance to think that at every opportunity that presents itself, because he is the main hero of the show. And if he doesn't do something like that when he has the opportunity, that is a wasted opportunity. And that's what's going to happen at the end of the episode, and I find that really, really, really disappointing. And that's the main thing that drags it down to a five. I suppose it would have been up at a six if Alex had freed the Fodden at the end, and... Maybe even that would have been enough to earn it a 7, and then up to an 8, perhaps, if the Fodden were more interestingly done, and the locations were more interestingly realised, and it just didn't feel so flat to me. But that's my main problem with it. Alex not releasing the Fodden from servitude when he had the chance. Because he should. Thematically, he should. From a story point of view, he should. From a character point of view, he should. From a practical point of view, he should. But it just doesn't happen. There's no time or opportunity for it, but one should certainly have been made. A horrible missed opportunity with Alex there. Very much like in the previous episode, where Alex broke the Agalophone spell early, and they were keeping it a secret so Alex could do something important, and he didn't end up doing anything important. As I always say, Alex really is coming through as the hero of the show here in Season 2, and often that's really good, really exciting, very titillating, and I enjoy it a great deal on so many levels. But that doesn't mean that missed opportunities to add to Alex's catalogue of brilliant, heroic moments don't matter. They do matter, particularly when they're so important to the episode as a whole and would improve it so much in so many ways. So as I say, that is my main problem with the episode. But another big problem is, as I say, the end between Imhotep and Corlin. Now, obviously, to get back to the status quo, Imhotep can't hold Corlin's brief defection here against him too much or for too long and as I will say in a moment Colin does in the end give in and throw the trident of Voth to Imhotep rather than trying to really rebel against him when the chips are down so obviously Imhotep appreciated that 
This bit where they get trapped in the water below the ice, the Cornels, that must bring back bad memories for Evie, mustn't it, of when she fell through the ice as a child. But she doesn't look particularly bothered about it. I guess she's really over that now, after facing up to the fear in fear itself. Well, I like the way Alex uses some useful science knowledge there to help them out. The closer to the shore, the warmer the water and the thinner the ice. And Alex also spots these two friendly walruses who have come to swim them to the shore. It's getting a bit silly now. But what Imhotep says at the end, anyway, when Corlin says, I'm your servant, I'll do anything for you. Imhotep says, I know, and you will be of service, in ways you cannot imagine, in a very sinister way. And Corlin looks quite nervous about that. What exactly might those ways entail? Sounds very sinister and very ominous, and promises interesting times to come. Imhotep using Corlin as some sort of vessel for some evil spirit that's going to consume his soul or something. But nothing comes of it. It promises much. In the episode, the interplay between them delivers little. And in the series as a whole, that little bit of cliffhanger, ooh, what does he mean, what's going to happen, actually comes to nothing. So that is very disappointing. So, those couple of very disappointing things about this episode have dragged it down to a 5 from what probably should be a 7, I would think. But I thought it was quite interesting here, the bit where Corlin is tempted by good. Now, heroes, true heroes, are tempted by evil and overcome it. And in a couple of episodes' time, there is the bit where that should and almost does happen to Alex in the Wellspring of Darkness episode, but it's not done very well. It uses MacGuffins far too much, and I don't think it comes across as it should. So Alex kind of misses out on his defying evil, being tempted by evil and defying it, which is a shame for his heroic journey. However, here... We've got the kind of inverse of that, and Corlin is tempted by good. And he really does think about it. Ah, here we go. Now this is good. Alex actually snatches the locket from under Imhotep's nose using his Magi skills. Slides in there, grabs it, and now he's in charge of the Farden. And I like the voice work Chris does there of, uh, okay, I'm in charge of you now, huh? Absolutely wonderful. But, he gives them the command. Clean up this trash, talking about Imhotep, and bring me that fancy fork. And that's all he gets to do with the locket. There should be an opportunity at the end for him to free the Farden from their servitude, as I say. And he just doesn't do it. He doesn't consciously make the decision not to do it or anything, but it's a part that should have been included and wasn't, and it is a missed opportunity and a disgrace. And there's the bit where Colin actually loses his balls figuratively and chucks the trident to Imhotep anyway. But he was before being tempted by good. Evie was saying to him, you could be the saviour of the world. Colin Weasler, hero. And he's like, really? But... Like when the hero doesn't give in to temptation by evil, Corlin in the end doesn't give in to temptation by good and chucks the trident to Imhotep. Because he's just a bit too much of a coward, really, to stand up and be a hero, even though he quite wanted to be. Very much the opposite of Alex. So I thought that was an interesting bit of turning on the head of a familiar scene. Temptation by good rather than temptation by evil. Again, promises much, but delivers very little, really. And the end of the episode is kind of rushed there, with the avalanche and everything. And Does Alex still have the locket? Well, there's no reason to think he doesn't. And maybe he'll find a way in the future to return it to the Fodden and release them from their servitude. Certainly that's the case in my head canon. And here's this bit that should lead on to something interesting, as I say. In ways you can't even imagine, Colin's like, oh god, what have I let myself in for? As it turns out, absolutely nothing. So there we go. 
a 5 out of 10 episode that should have been a 7 out of 10, and I was absolutely horrified to see that this one was written by Tom and Greg. They've completely lost it. Alex is your hero, your main hero, Tom and Greg, and you've missed that golden opportunity to use him as such. So maybe he's not your hero at all. Maybe he's just mine. Join me again next time for a commentary on an episode that I like more than most Season 2 episodes, so that'll be a nice change in tone. Time before time.